So um, I recently came across a 2018 report by the US Commission on Civil Rights, which stated that Native Americans are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, exposing them to multiple climate impacts, including forced relocation due to rising sea levels and the loss of natural resources, crops, game and fish that provide cultural well-being in addition to sustenance. So I thought we could just start by discussing how climate change has already affected indigenous communities in the US and beyond. There's a perception that climate change is coming, but it is here for many of these communities. Uh, Dr. Wildcat, could I start with you? Yes, uh, San Lei. Uh, yes, it's it's a great question. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here and certainly be on a panel with uh, distin distinguished uh, indigenous colleagues like uh, Elizabeth and Clint. Uh, I think it's definitely here. Uh, and, you know, Haskell being the de facto international tribal college in the United States, uh, I hear from students who, um, you know, are facing fires in the Intermountain West. Um, talked to uh, a young woman just, uh, you know, several days ago who she said, well, we're, we're lucky. The fire only came within about 200 feet of her cabin um, and uh, living there in Northern California uh, on uh, uh, her ancestral homelands. And, uh, you know, we've got people I've worked with, good friends down on uh, the bayou in Louisiana, and they are uh, not dealing with fire and heat. They're dealing with heat and this increasing wave of category four, category five hurricanes that they're facing. Um, I think everyone who's paying attention today uh, can see the effects of climate change. In fact, I heard a presentation by the uh, one of the leaders of uh, the national, uh, the fifth national climate assessment, which is being organized right now. And he gave this number, and I don't question it. I think it's probably accurate. He said one in three Americans this last year have been affected by extreme weather, uh, fires, drought, some kind of physical phenomenon related to climate change. I think American Indians are particularly, and Alaska Natives particularly vulnerable because of where we live, the fact that we continue uh, often to practice life ways that have us very uh, interconnected with the land, the air, and the water. And uh, I think it's also true that we're very vulnerable because of where we live. Um, there still is, believe it or not, a, a, a digital divide in uh, uh, among you know the native nations in the United States, and um, these are issues that make the delivery of uh, assistance, healthcare. We've seen this in COVID, uh, uh, very challenging, and so I do think that. Um, American Indians right now and Alaska Natives are probably feeling as much, if not more, than anyone else, the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. And plus, we have a tradition of being very mindful about what's going on, too, as uh, Clint and uh, uh, Elizabeth can speak to. That, that sense of mindfulness is a part of who we are. So we're sort of brought up to pay attention to what's going on. And I tell you, even in Lawrence, Kansas, where I'm sitting less than a half a mile from the south bank of the uh, Kaw River as it meanders across the uh, north edge of Lawrence and uh, on the ancestral homelands of the Kaw Nation, um, you can see the impacts of, of climate change. Uh, uh, I'll give one example, and then I'll turn the floor over to my colleagues or to the next question. Um, you know, we've noticed in, in our household um, the absence of June bugs. In fact, I'm going to ask Clint about this one in, in uh, uh, Oklahoma. When I grew up in beginning in June and July, your screen doors would be covered where the lights were outside, but with June bugs. Mm -hmm. And we started talking about it. And 
we don't see any June bugs anymore. Mm. What's happened? Last year, we had the birds disappear for about two months. Birds are migratory. They move around. They go where the food is. But I'll tell you what, they left Lawrence, Kansas last August for a good period of time in the late summer, and people were talking about it. Mm -hmm. It was climate change related. Yeah. Clint, do you want to share your experiences with ongoing um, evidence? Yeah, well, um, first of all, Oseo um, Nigatawu, hello, everyone. Um, just want to echo uh, Dr. Wildcat's uh, gratitude to, to be invited to and to sit on this panel with uh, amazing scholars and, and, and good friends. And um, um, also just to uh, recognize that where I'm speaking from, uh, what is known as uh, Longmont, Colorado, we're on the ancestral homelands of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples here. So just wanted to emplace myself and, and express my gratitude. Uh, and then also to pick up on, on June bugs. Yeah, I, I absolutely remember that. Um, I, I grew up in, in Dallas, uh, Texas. And so uh, even, uh, you know, in a metropolitan area, um, I do have those memories, vivid memories of uh, screen doors being full of June bugs. <laughs> and so I resonate with what you're saying and, and I'm, I'm also just in, um, uh, in, in shock to, to hear that, that uh, it's affecting um, that, that vital uh, seasonal uh, occurrence of, of mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, uh, our other than human relatives and, and to, to think about it in that way of, of, of being connected to them through those experiences, but also um, the, the memory that they hold um, seasonally um, is, is all about uh, what it's like to, to grow up in that part of the world. Um, and so uh, my, you know, my, my initial remarks to this question, um, Paul, I, 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 once again, I'm, I'm really um, humbled to be on this panel because, uh, you know, I, I actually draw a lot from, uh, from Dan Wildcat's work and, and how I think about and teach uh, in the classroom uh, climate change to my students. And so we read his book, Red Alert, Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, reframe, if you will, the, the the question here, because you know my approach to climate change um, and and the, the work that I do is is um, you know as you said uh, connected to land based practices and and the perpetuation of of traditional knowledge systems, um, and so I I'm more connected to this topic when it comes to. Uh, those types of activities and those mm -hmm. types of programs. Uh, and so I, I, I haven't had the opportunity to sit on uh, these amazing panels and, and, um, and programs that you mentioned uh, that Dr. Wildcat has spearheaded, um, you know, the, the, the type of work that uh, Dr. Hoover has, has been working on, on kind of on, on an international scale, if you think about um, our, um, our indigenous nations, um, all of those um, projects that you mentioned are, are, are just incredible in scope. Um, I come to climate change from um, a, a much more um, um, place-specific uh, mm -hmm. point of view, and and when I think about this in terms of how I can best convey um, the moment that we're in, I think about um, you know, uh, Dan, you you have a passage in your your book. Um, I think it starts right off with this point. Uh, this is um, the we can see this as a fourth removal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so when we put it into this perspective of experiences with, quite frankly, the apocalypse, uh, the en ending of worlds, right? Um, this is not something that, uh, I I'm not prepared to talk about this as a new thing um, uh, because mm -hmm. you know, the first removal that, Dan, you mentioned literal removal from homelands. Many mm -hmm. indigenous nations have histories of this. Um, the removal of children from their families during the allotment and assimilation period, um, the relocation uh, to urban centers during the urban relocation period of federal Indian policy, and then climate change uh, mm -hmm. being the fourth removal. And so, um, you know, we put into that grand perspective of, um, you know, the losing uh, or the, the, the loss of worlds, the loss of, of, of relatives via removal. Um, and, you know, I uh, would say this is, kind of reframes the question of when did indigenous peoples start experiencing climate change? Mm -hmm. um, uh, when you do that, it, it really began with the onslaught of colonialism. And so mm -hmm. 
we might refer to it as the colonial scene as opposed to the Anthropocene. Um, but um, I'll, I'll, I will just say, you know, picking up on some of the themes of your question, uh, you know, in terms of exposure, vulnerability, uh, dispossession, and the impact on food systems, um, I think there's a lot of things we can get to uh, in, in, in later um, a discussion among each other. But um, I would just say the other um, uh, major thing that I mentioned to my students is this paradox of vulnerability mm. uh, when it comes to indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, also you know, poor communities, communities of color, um, that they're off, we are and our communities are, are often more susceptible to the effects of climate change when um, we're the least responsible for putting and setting climate change in motion. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of complicates, again, this, um, uh, these categories of the human. Um, so it kind of makes you ask, you know, which human are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, I will pass it off to uh, Dr. Hooper. Thank you for that. I just want to say that, I, that this theme of place-based cultural identities is really important to get down to the literal ground level to think about how these are affecting uh, community maintenance practices uh, that have been going on for centuries. Um, and I know your work on the, we could talk more about your work on the, with the Cherokee elders. Um, but Liz, uh, Dr. Hoover, um, you're in Alaska, which has been dealing with a lot of, um, perhaps on the front line of, of climate change, perhaps you could Talk a little bit about that, what, you're, what you've learned up there, but also about your work in general. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Um, my name is Elizabeth Hoover. I just wanted to, to clarify one thing from Dr. Rozier's uh, excellent introduction before, and that uh, while Akwazesne has become like a, a second home to me, and there are definitely folks there who are friends and relatives. I'm not originally from there. Mm. Um, so I grew up a little bit uh, south of there in, in upstate New York, but now I've relocated out to Ohlone territory in the Bay Area. Um, and today I am zooming in from Cordova, Alaska, where I am here visiting with the Native Conservancy, which is a, an organization that's working to help more Alaska Native people set up kelp farms um, as a way of recovering the, the food economy, the, uh, the basic economy after the Exxon Valdez oil spill and to get kelp in the water because they, they call kelp the sequoia of plants for the way that it's able to sequester carbon and to process nitrogen um, and other you know, things that we, we don't necessarily need in the ocean and in the air. Um, so for me, this is a, a very new area. I, I grew up farming and gardening and, and seed saving. And so um, you know, my experience so far has been in working with communities that are trying to figure out how to adapt heirloom seeds to uh, changing climate and whether um, that's, as, as Clint mentioned, if you look at Dr. Walcott's work or Dr. Kyle White um, talking about the climate change that nations have undergone who are forcibly relocated to very different spaces and who are now trying to recover heirloom seeds and figure out how to get them to grow in these very new spaces, but also even for people who weren't relocated terribly far, um, who are dealing with very different climates than those seeds were originally grown and adapted for. So for example, this summer, you know, I went back to the East Coast and my dad's corn patch was absolutely inundated with rain. He's digging trenches around it. His corn plants are stunted and too much water. And then as I'm driving back, you know, visiting with friends, and, uh, you know, Oneida folks in Wisconsin and kind of from there on West, it was so dry and California is so dry. So, you know, some people working with really similar crops are either completely inundated with water or are in a space where there's not enough water. And so thinking about um, how do you save seed in the hopes that, okay, this year, this seed did really well during a drought. So let's make sure we plant some of that in future years. And okay, this year, you know, this corn did, did okay, completely inundated with water. And how do you make sure you have some of, um, you know, the genes of that corn? Mm -hmm. I think you're muted. Mm -hmm. So trading your seeds north and getting to know your neighbors a little farther south um, and making sure that those, those old trade connections are, are revived um, and utilized in that way. So um, I think that's kind of where I think about the proactive ways. And so the, the damage that is um, being done to food systems, but also to, to point out, you know, and what's 
here the Exxon Valdez oil spill is still so fresh in everyone's minds and the absolute trauma that that caused to have millions of gallons of oil um, spilling over this. And it's still in the beaches, it's in the rocks, it's in the landscape. Um, and the damage that that caused to people's connections to their their food sources and to the environment. And so to recognize that, you know, connecting that to all of these oil pipelines that are being jammed down the throats of indigenous nations across the US, Canada, um, South America. And so recognizing that these dirty fossil fuel industries that are doing the most to contribute to this climate change that are causing the problems that Dr. Wildcat mentioned earlier, um, that the processes that are leading to all of this carbon going to the atmosphere are also causing damage in and of themselves on the ground in this very moment. So there's damage in the immediate and there's future damage. Um, so being able to properly point fingers at some of the, the really big and bad actors is important. I learned today that you know the Vex Exxon Valdez folks dragged out litigation for so long that it didn't actually end up costing them much. They just kind of paid using the interest on their um, money that they already had. So thinking about how to target some of these bigger folks is important too, I think. Uh, so each of you have spent your career studying and advancing traditional eco ecological knowledge. Maybe we can just talk a little bit more about um, examples about how that knowledge values particular programs can help mitigate climate change. You mentioned kelp farms. Um, uh, maybe you can just share some of your experiences uh, in some of your research and in home communities. Dan, can we come back to you? Yes, I. Uh, it's a great question, and and I really look forward to to hearing Elizabeth and Clint talk about their work too. Um, I think, first of all, I always use traditional ecological knowledges. I talk about it in the plural mm -hmm. because our knowledges are very much bound up with places. It's they're born of this symbiotic relationship between a people and a particular place on the planet. So uh, those. Uh, uh, Haudenosaunee knowledges are going to be very different from those Diné and Apache and, and Pueblo knowledges. So there are knowledges in the world. And I think the value of them, um, I'll take one example that um, it's the most obvious, so let's talk about it. Um, I think from the Great Plains all the way through uh, the North and West, we have good evidence and our own evidence through our stories and our own customary uh, traditions of how we work with the living relatives we shared this planet with, uh, the use of fire. Um, and now all of a sudden, this is very much on everyone's mind. Um, a lot of the fire problems we have in the Inner Mountain West, again, are anthropogenic. They are human-created fire problems. And uh, because people used to think, you know, a fire in this one-dimensional sense of fire is bad. Well, we know through many tribal traditions of people who lived in forest areas and even on the prairies, the use of fire was so critical in maintaining healthy biological diversity in the tall grass prairies, but fire was used. And so, you know, we find it, when I say we indigenous people, find it sort of ironic that uh, today foresters and people who are looking at these problems are discovering fire and that, oh, well, we should be burning more regularly. We should be using fire. And uh, again, it, um, it's knowledge that is ancient with our own traditions and it, it's living knowledge. It never went away. And uh, I've got to tell you, that's where my hope lies right now. Um, uh, I think the holders of tr traditional ecological knowledges, indigenous people, I think they're, if we're going to successfully deal with climate change, 
I'm willing to wager their voices are going to be the most important voices in the 21st century mm -hmm. because they understand we've got to change our whole worldview about our relationship mm -hmm. with the balance of life we share this world with. Mm -hmm. So fire, I, that's, that's a low hanging fruit. It's on everyone's mind, but our traditions of using fire to help uh, create healthy forests, healthy gra grass uh, lands are thousands, hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great example. Yeah, the Yurok, my understanding is that the Yurok in California are helping California firefighters, you know, adapt some of their traditional practices. Mm -hmm. um, Clint, uh, what have you uh, found in uh, how these, um, these programs can help mitigate climate change on the local level as well as on the, on the national level? Yeah, I, I want to pick up on, on what Dan said just at the end here and, and, um, Again, I, I, I don't mean to be uh, uh, <laughs> the, the reframer in the conversation, but my brain works in ways that uh, uh, we just kind of shift the conversation to what Dan was talking about in terms of uh, voices and, and having a, um, you know, kind of a broader impact on the decisions that are made, the policies that are, are in, in, in enforced when it comes to dealing with climate change issues. So to me, mitigate de depends on how you define that word. I mean. In my experience, um, uh, well, it, when, when I think about mitigate, I think about having the power to change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it becomes an issue of governance. Um, mm -hmm. In the work that I do, I, I find that we're mainly faced with adaptation um, measures. How do we maintain our relationships to land and to other than human beings in the face of the client, uh, the changes that we're experiencing and, and the constrictions that we have on our ability to enact these land-based practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where a lot of our, our, our efforts are directed. Again, it's very place-based, it's very um, uh, focused on um, a sense of uh, uh, surviving, but also thriving for uh, future generations to be able to do the same thing that we're doing. And um, so much has been lost in the process that we're also rebuilding at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of that work has entailed um, tribal conservation um, uh, programs. And in that regard, uh, w when I think about mitigation, um, I think that um, indigenous peoples are already doing so much uh, of this in the sheer fact that when you look at a map of the, the globe and you compare that uh, the, the biodiversity hotspots uh, globally to the um, linguistic diversity, the concentrations of, of linguistic diversity, uh, they, they almost uh, overlap um, seamlessly. And so a lot of the indigenous territories throughout the globe are the ones that are still being protected and defended. Mm -hmm. um, and so to the extent that um, we can contribute to that by making sure that the very limited lands that we have left, it's, it's uh, a matter of 98% land loss when you think about tribal trust lands and the way that it's impacted the Cherokee Nation since uh, Oklahoma statehood. Uh, in 1907, so the, the culmination of a uh, couple of uh, decades of a lot, the, the allotment policy has led us to a point where, um, you know, we have very, very limited lands that are technically tribally controlled. Um, and in the, in the face of that, we're having to uh, understand how Cherokee people not only can get to them, because some of them are landlocked by private, um, you know, private land, but also as um, the climate shifts, you know, how are those um, uh, plants that Cherokee people, for example, once used to gather uh, uh, being threatened? Uh, and, and so it's this, this sense of the, the, um, the climate is shifting. And um, it, to, to my previous point about um, Dan's concept of the fourth removal, uh, Cherokee people are being removed, only we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, our, our communities are staying put, our access to the places uh, where uh, we once gathered or where our, our rural communities had access to them uh, are, are being um, uh, fundamentally um, changed um, due to the, the, the nature that the, the land and, the, the, and, and other than human beings um, don't obey uh, political boundaries, um, including land boundaries, property boundaries. Um, 
so um, as I was kind of getting to and picking up on Dan's last point, uh, mitigation from an indigenous standpoint seems to me uh, to require uh, a radical change in how people relate to each other and to the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll stop there and, and, and let Liz pick up mm -hmm. on this one. Please. Yeah, I think to connect some of what Drs. Walcott and Carol were talking about here, thinking about the use of fire and the increasing biodiversity that happens on the land. Um, one of my students is Alma Mutsen, Alexi, who works at the Alma Mutsen Land Trust. And it's been such a, a challenge as part of that, they're co-managing some of this um, land that's it's owned by other organizations because they're not a federally recognized tribe, but they've been working really hard to restore that land to what it was like at the time of European contact. And that requires putting fire on the land in order to make it productive again, to be growing the kinds of species that people are interested in eating. Um, because a lot of conservation organizations have this, this dichotomy in their minds that it's like, okay, Europeans came and, and ruined everything, you know, just clear cut everything, chopped everything down. So the only way to um, have it go back to its natural state is to leave it alone and let it just get totally overgrown. And so that, you know, some of these organizations were pretty horrified that the Alamuts and were like, oh, we need to cut down all these Douglas fir trees. Um, we need to burn this area because that's how you get the kind of very productive um, pastures and grass seeds. And they're like, ah, cut down trees. And it's like, well, nobody eats Douglas firs. <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, Karen Norgard and, and Beth Rose Middleton and some of these other scholars in the um, California and the Northwest have written about how when you leave these forests completely alone, they get all choked up they become food deserts of a different kind um, because there aren't the different kinds of you know, species in there that, that are feeding off of each other and that indigenous people are looking for as part of reviving traditional diets. Um, so these kinds of land stewarding practices that indigenous people developed in California and around the country for maintaining these landscapes in a way that fed more people um, in the broad sense, as Clint was mentioning. So I think that's really a really important part of, you know, preventing some of these really devastating wildfires is having this cultural fire back on the land. And, you know, I've, I've visited with some of these communities that are, are putting this fire back on the land and they distinguish between prescribed burns, um, which is, you know, Cal Fire and these guys just going out there and chopping and burning and cultural burns, which are these, you know, amazing gatherings where people are coming together and working and cutting and burning in specific ways um, that don't just scorch everything down, but make sure that plants are coming back straighter and, um, you know, better basketry material and better berry bushes and that kind of thing. So, you know, remembering that, you know, cultural burns are different than, you know, an organization or a, an agency picks up on that and, you know, puts it forth, prescribes it like medicine. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are ways that some of this traditional ecological knowledge um, can be applied and needs to be applied in a cultural way and not just taken up by agencies and applied in their own way. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, I know that in 1972, several dozen Native activists traveled to Stockholm to participate in the uh, United Nations Conference on the Environment. How, uh, how active um, have Indigenous activists been in um, working with these broader uh, agencies in trying to it, inject indigenous perspectives and values in the process and, and what how receptive have people been how receptive have scientists been to to thinking of different approaches to these problems uh, this cultural shift that um, you're talking about yeah i'll i'll take a a run at that first and and look forward to see what my colleagues have to say um i think it's it's interesting that uh, when you talk about, you know, um, uh, the COP meetings and the big national meetings, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, uh, convenings, that, um, you know, the indigenous faces that show up at those meetings um, are, are often people who are part of political coalitions, uh, Organizations like Tom Goldtooth's IEN, which is very, uh, uh, you know, involved, uh, uh, 
some of the organizations like our, our International Treaty Council, bodies like that, that are making presence at those international convenings. And I, I'm gonna be self-critical, self-critical of our own nations here for a minute. I wish we had more of our official, of our elected tribal leadership at those meetings. And I think, you know, there are a lot of reasons that they don't go to those. We've got a lot of problems right here we've got to deal with. But I do think that, that we lose out by not being in those larger international forums. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I, I hope to see change, you know, uh, before I start my journey to the stars or the other side of that river, is that... Uh, we will see more engagement by, uh, you know, like members of uh, uh, member nations of the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI, and those start making those kinds of international convenings. Mm -hmm. I think the tribes now are, uh, a lot of them are getting very much up to speed on how to deal with federal agencies, because we've always got a dozen federal agencies that want to tell us what we need to do and how we should do it. And we're getting pretty good at saying, well, wait a second here. You know, we've got our own plans about how we want, you know, to manage our land, our air, our water, our forests, uh, our grasslands. And so I, I think pretty good at that, but I wish, uh, I, I think Tom Goldtooth and people like with the uh, International Treaty that those people who are going to these meetings, I'm glad they're there. I just wish we had more of our elected tribal leaders there who could speak mm -hmm. as the national leaders for our people. I think that would count for something. And we would learn something. We would learn something from our relatives uh, from all around the globe. Mm -hmm. And um, so th that's kind of my take on that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hoover, you're in Alaska. Do you, do you know what um, Alaska natives are doing to work together to assert a you know, sort of a unified voice? I can't speak um, a whole lot to the whole situation here in Alaska, but I know organizations like the Alaska Coalition Against Toxics, ACAT, um, has done a lot of traveling to um, the, the world stage to, to really present the situation here of the impact of climate change for Alaska Native folks, but also persistent organic pollutants and other problems. So, you know, communities here are not only dealing with melting ice flows and dramatically changing climates, but also um, kind of having all of these persistent organic pollutants from around the world that end up raining down on this space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and polluting food sources in that way. So I know that's something, those have been like two different issues that that organization has really worked hard to bring the, the kind of global attention to. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Carroll, do you, what, what do you see the, the value of, of moving from these local places to national or international um, uh, organizations to try to, to change the conversation, to inject that kind of cultural value? Yeah, I think you know to to get to um, to Dr. Wildcat's point about um, well, the way I see it is you know putting out these these fires, putting out these local fires, um, mm -hmm. and as, as you mentioned, Dan, um, just have feeling uh, as far as like tribal leadership, official elected uh, elected officials, uh, feeling like they have a, a lot to deal with uh, locally, but at the same time, I would think. Uh, you know, in addition to what you're proposing, um, uh, you know, something that um, I've been recently writing about has, has and, and, you know, is, I think is, is inherent in the work that the medicine keepers who I work with uh, in Oklahoma, um, um, how they approach these things is, um, you know, how can we, you know, put into policy, so uh, it, within our own houses, uh, these types of uh, mm -hmm. models uh, that I think indigenous knowledge uh, or, and more broadly uh, indigenous um, ethical frameworks have to offer the world. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, um, Orrin Lyons years ago at uh, one of the many instances of, of uh, him and, and uh, many other uh, Haudenosaunee people uh, traveling to the uh, United Nations said, you know, where's the seat in this council for uh, yeah. the Eagle? Um, you know, where's the seat in this council for, you know, we, we look to um, the, the, the Fanganui River in New Zealand and, and how the, the Fanganui Iwi, the people of that river worked uh, uh, incredibly hard and, and, and were able to enact personhood for that, that being. And so, you know, how can we continue to, um, uh, yes, push in the international forms, but also model that at home? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of that. And maybe I'm um, not looking hard enough, but I haven't seen our tribal leaders say, okay, you know, outside of, you know, Cherokee Nation, we have an endangered species list. I think that's a good start. Mm -hmm. um, but what about, you know, political representation or, or personhood mm -hmm. or some sort of uh, voice um, for for the land and for our waterways, how do we how do we do the same kind of thing? Um, I would just kind of also want to say like uh, I would read the the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a climate justice document. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of um, I, I think there's a, a couple of flaws in terms of um, um, uh, you know how it was. Um, the constraints under which those who worked really hard to get this passed at the UN um um presented a lot of um flaws i think in terms of the ability for it to really recognize for example sovereignty uh you know you see article i think it's article 52 which is reifying the settler states and other states that indigenous nations reside within but nonetheless you look at all the other articles that really detail um, a lot of the important issues for indigenous peoples, and you can connect those clearly to environmental issues. Um, and you can read it as a climate justice document if you if you uh, go back to what we've been saying already about radical change in how people relate to each other and the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know, um, <clears throat> Dr. Wildcat, you have said in so many words that the the large states that are uh, at the heart of these international organizations, they're, they're not going to act. They're not going to act in, in the ways that they're not going to embrace a cultural uh, revolution that is called for. So what is on the on the national level, has the federal government, especially now that Deb Haaland is Secretary of Interior, do you see more promise in um, forming partnerships, more receptivity on the part of um, the BIA, which has rarely been receptive, but do you see some promise um, moving forward? Well, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but let's 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 be honest. Um, Deb Howland and I send her good energy and prayers every day because she is in the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. She is in a very large bureaucratic system with so many demands put on her. And I do want to give a shout out. We we've got to first of all take our hat off to to Deb for the fact that she has called on a true reckoning of the history of federal Indian boarding schools mm -hmm. in the United States. That took tremendous strength and, and courage. And it's going to be hard work because, you know, we, we, we've talked about these removals and those boarding schools played a tremendous role in a removal mm -hmm. of our peoples, of a, a a, an attempt, wholesale attempt to dismantle our culture and our identities. Uh, you know, I think, where does my hope reside? My hope resides in the fact that I do think there are, and maybe this is a generational thing, Paul, you probably have your own thoughts on this, but I do think that Younger scientists, uh, early career scientists, regardless of their ethnicity, are much more open to understanding some of the epistemological trappings of the way science used to be taught when I was in junior mm -hmm. high. I mean, I went to school thinking there was a, uh, in, in grade school, elementary school, high school, something called the scientific method. Mm -hmm. There's one method that people can use, but 
that's not the scientific method. I mean, that's our problem with climate change. So mm-hmm. all of those people who were brought up that are critical of climate change, those were the recipients of the scientific method because they will tell you, they'll tell all of us, well, you can't say that. You don't know that because you didn't perform an experiment. They think you have to perform an experiment, controlled experiment, to have scientific knowledge. Well, Rather we need to disabuse. Yeah, we need to disabuse people of that. And I think there are a lot of very of younger scientists now who understand that mm-hmm. and are open. Um, so I'm hopeful about that. And because I work a lot with a lot of federal agencies, it's not a wholesale embrace. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of even those allies we have, they still look at our knowledge as needing a validation by their science. Mm -hmm. And what we're telling them is, no, our knowledge is our knowledge. It operates a little differently if you will listen to us and look at what we do and how we do it. You will gain knowledge you can't gain through the methodologies that you are using. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're at now. And I think it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. I've seen this with NSF, I've seen it with AGU. Mm -hmm. They are having those discussions now and um, the jury's out. Let's see what happens. I I wanna see when they start funding those indigenously Mm -hmm. conceived and inspired research projects that draw on our intellectual traditions and deep wisdom. Yeah. Dr. Hoover and Dr. Carroll, do you see a turning point or a similar turning point in, in sort of a, a, a respect, renewed respect or new respect for indigenous values and experiences? And I think what I really wanted to highlight is that in addition to you know, these broader international efforts to gain you know attention on the the international stage and through these processes is the value of all of these grassroots organizations that have popped up that have pushed for um you know providing support to communities that they couldn't get through these broader venues so like the indian collective has a um, climate justice program arm that is working to support frontline communities. And so, you know, routing foundation money that way. The Native Conservancy here that's working to help uh, Alaska Native farmers and people interested in mariculture to get these permits um, to do it in ways that they, that people have a hard time navigating these bureaucratic systems. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Dr. Wildcat mentioned the, the Intertribal Indian Treaty Council. Um, so you have all of these you know, hardworking folks working through these different grassroots organizations to help, you know, small tribal communities or help individuals who are uh, fighting to to remedy some of these things um, and who are tired of trying to to speak out to these, Mm -hmm. um, you know, broader government agencies. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carroll? Uh, I would definitely um, second what uh, what Liz was saying, uh, as far as the importance of grassroots activism and and, and that kind of uh, real pressure that um, uh, folks can put on the international and national community when it comes to recognizing um, indigenous knowledge as something distinct from Western science. I do think, you know, when I came about in uh, grad school, um, it was around the time when TEK right was getting. Uh, a lot of attention in the scientific community. And I remember scouring um, um, some pretty amazing issues of journals like uh, environmental applications um, and the, you know, just being energized and refreshed to see uh, that reflected in the the scientific um, literature. Um, And I don't know, I I would kind of go back to to Dan's point. I don't know if it's, uh, I think it's come a long way for sure. Uh, hands down. I mean, I think that is a, is a you know, that kind of uh, point around you, you know, 2000 um, when that issue came out. Uh, Dan, I think you were in that issue. So, um, uh, <laughs> so thank you for, for paving that way. And, and, but I still think that the, there's still a long way to go. So back to the point of um, not structuring the conversation around how TEK uh, measures up to Western science. 
um, but reframing um, the worldview in, entirely to, to, to fundamentally question uh, Western science. And, and we've got a lot of uh, amazing work to draw from. I mean, um, not the least, uh, you know, Vine Deloria Jr.'s work on that question, uh, but really taking seriously indigenous knowledge systems, I think is mm -hmm. going to be, um, uh, that's where I uh, would, would say uh, the future should put its attention, uh, or, you know, put its energies toward is, um, uh, not kind of creating a little space within um, the the house of Western science, but um, creating another house entirely, you know. Yeah, and what is, um, maybe this would be the last question for all of you before we turn it to our uh, patient uh, audience. What what has been your experience in the classroom in, in communicating some of these ideas? Uh, what, what can you tell us, uh, what can you share with us about teaching strategies in um, in addressing young people, some of whom feel overwhelmed by the, the problem of climate change. Um, how can we keep them focused on, on what they can do uh, in part by adopting some of these uh, values and questioning um, Western science as this uh, sole paradigm? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll go first. I'm in a very fortunate position because the institution I teach at has all native students from all over the contiguous 48 states and Alaska. And so they don't find it a hard thing to understand the limitations of certain Western attitudes and patterns of behavior and thought, including. But I do think they do. They do experience like many of us myself included, I'm a story about myself. Those of you who, who are familiar with Red Alert know it's a, it's a little book, it's 150 pages. That was the most difficult 150 pages I ever wrote. And the reason was, is because I spent the first about 18 months getting ready for that book by doing nothing but reading Western science about climate change. And I got depressed. Western science, I was reading and I was going to say, why am I even writing this book? I mean, we are headed for global catastrophe. And so now, no, I was reading the scientists, the people from NASA, from USGS, from EPA, from NOAA, uh, from NCAR. And then I started talking to people I view as my elders, Dr. Henrietta Mann, mm -hmm. Albert Whitehat. Uh, and I started talking to them about this. And they reminded me of something. They said, Dan, don't forget. Yeah. Remember your traditions. Our teachers don't have letters after their name, names, and they reside out of doors. Look to the earth, look to the plants, mm -hmm. look to the trees. Those were our teachers. Look to the animals. And you know what? When I did that, I thought there's hope. Mm -hmm. Because in spite of everything we've done, and we've done some damage, and we've got more damage that we will see coming, the earth is mightily resilient. Mm -hmm. And, and I quit looking at in a mirror at what humans were doing and remembered, oh, wait a second, my ancient teachers are in the forest or on the prairie or along the river. And I tell you, that gave, that gave me hope. And so I always tell my students that, mm -hmm. you know, when you get depressed, leave your, turn your phone off and just get out of doors, mm -hmm. sit, walk and you'll be amazed at the beauty that surrounds you. That, that's my answer to that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Hoover? I think that's some pretty darn good advice right there. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the, the, the get outdoors, it's mm -hmm. just the only way to work. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, students do get overwhelmed. It's easy to to get overwhelmed when you look at the information and you see the the foreboding news that oh, it's it's too late. The tipping point has been 
um, mm -hmm. surpassed anyway. And so it seems that focusing on um, community level projects that increase people's access to um, the environment and to food and to trying to, to tackle these issues, um, you know, one source at mm -hmm. a time, as I mentioned in the beginning, that um, some of the, the major polluters who are contributing to this climate change process are also um, causing grim problems on the ground in the immediate. You know, this is why organizations like Honor the Earth and GNU Collective and these folks have been fighting these pipelines in um, Minnesota and, you know, fighting for the expansion of the tar sands. And so I found that when students are able to, to focus on, you know, projects, whether for their own communities, um, you know, fighting refineries in, in Richmond or in other spaces or, um, you know, supporting some of these other distinct projects, picking a project um, mm -hmm. rather than trying to tackle every single aspect of global climate change um, mm -hmm. has been more empowering in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Starting with the local, with the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Would just second all of the above. And um, uh, I had the um, privilege of teaching one of my favorite courses um, last spring. And uh, it was a, obviously it's a very different time um, to, to teach uh, environmental issues in um, Native North America. Um, we were online, we were re remote. And um, I decided uh, in January, I was gonna re overhaul the syllabus and, and make this uh, uh, semester different than my usual um, um, you know, assignments and, and, and other issues, uh, other parts of the course. And so I, I integrated a field report component into the course. Mm -hmm. And so getting to Dan's uh, point, uh, anything that gets you outside uh, and away from a screen, and then, yeah, you know, you're going to type it up, but you don't have to type it up. You can, um, you know, do a photo essay. You can, uh, and I tell you, I had the, the most amazing submissions from students. And I think that really impacted uh, you know, even had a, a a voice submission, kind of a podcast type style. Um, I think that helped uh, impact positively uh, mental health in this you know crazy year, this crazy time that we're still in. Um, but you know, we read um, uh, uh, Robin Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweet Grass, and I think there's a really good passage in there called uh, you know where she writes, "Despair is paralysis." You know. Uh, and that really sticks uh, with students and, 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 and sparks a conversation about, okay, what, what you know, what's to do? And, and so getting outdoors, focusing on a project, for me, it's, it's getting, uh, it when, when I can, getting into the garden um, here at the house and, um, you know, all of that. But I think she, she ends with this beautiful scene of, you know, what does restoration, what does ecological restoration really mean uh, from, from an indigenous perspective? And that's restoring relationships. And that's another thing that we're able to kind of really uh, grapple with is, you know, um, you know beyond the, um, like what, what Dan was saying with the, the doom and gloom of things, um, what is this work really about? Um, and, you know, uh, a colleague of mine, friend of mine, Kyle White, who Liz mentioned earlier, um, has a great, uh, well, he, he presented uh, for CU Boulder last year doing our, our Mellon Sawyer seminar, and he's working on uh, different uh, understandings of time uh, and, and kinship. And one of the takeaways that I have from, um, from that work is, you know, um, we've got some choices here. We can, we can really kind of work mm -hmm. to put out the fires quickly using the tools that we've always used. Uh, and by, by that, I mean, Western science, or we can do the hard and, and long, like uh, more long-term work of starting to rebuild relationships and, and kinship to the world and to each other. Um, and I think one is, is caught up in the immediacy of, of climate change and what we're, what we're viewing, but the other one is much more invested in the long-term and, and, and looking at creating sustainable futures in, in a real sense. Mm -hmm. Well, as a uh, someone who writes and teaches Native American and environmental issues, you've all given me a lot to think about, and I'm sure you've given the audience a lot to think about. They have some questions that they have posed, and I'm going to just read the first one. Um, 
can our panelists talk about how the Green New Deal sits with Native nations in the US? What does it to say, if anything, about the enduring blind spots in the US and our particular style of colonialism? Mm -hmm. So the Green New Deal, does that incorporate any of what we've been talking about tonight? Well, is that, um, is that a is that a source of promise uh, that that could be? I mean, it it you know I I don't want to be completely negative about it. Yes, it's it's, it's a source of it's better than having no green mm -hmm. no, new deal. But I think we've got to be very clear, and and I really like what Clint and Elizabeth have, have chosen to emphasize. Elizabeth's talking about those small community-driven grassroots program. Mm -hmm. uh, the Green New Deal is a big program. It works at large institutional levels. That does not necessarily work very well for indigenous people mm -hmm. who are invested in a community, in a living community, one that includes plants and animals. And and so I would say that one of the things that that I think is is missing from the Green New Deal is this appreciation for the fact that uh, you know Clint, you're so right in in some ways, and and I think Elizabeth has said as much too. Really, T E K is about restoring relationships that we once held sacred mm -hmm. with our non-human relatives we share this planet with. And there's nothing in the Green New Deal that suggests that will happen. We need what we need to address the physical climate change is a cultural climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think where that will happen is in the communities and in restoring those relationships that were once understood as sacred. So I'm not, I, I'm going to be supportive Mm -hmm. of the Green New Deal, but I'm not going to mistake it for what indigenous people are talking about. We're talking about something much more fundamental and deeper. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else want to engage that? No, I think absolutely. I think, um, you know, the, the part I support is shifting subsidies away from dirty, polluting industries and putting it mm -hmm. towards something a little bit more sustainable. So I think mm -hmm. there's a a start in there that's helpful. Um, but yeah, I totally agree as, as Dr. Wildcat mentioned, you know, that, that can't be where it begins and ends, that that's a, a good starting point, um, mm -hmm. but that these other kind of cultural shifts are gonna be what's really important as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't think, I think what, what uh, my colleague said about Green New Deal is, is better than I could have put it. Um, I'd like to kind of talk about land back as a, um, an mm -hmm. example. Of, yeah. of what this could look like. Um, and so, you know, it's really um, uh, to, to a lot of folks who, uh, you know, uh, aren't familiar with uh, what land back actually is. I mean, it's very blunt in terms of its direct message, right? Um, so we all know, you hear the phrase, you, you get a sense of what it means, right? Yeah. Um, but really on a deeper level, um, there's so much more to unpack with it. And, and that kind of uh, opens the door to a future conversation about, Okay, well, land back, yes, but it's also relations back, right? It's all it, it, it's 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 what Standing Rock, uh, the No Dapple movement, um, mm -hmm. uh, sent a resounding message throughout the world of you know treaty rights, respecting and upholding uh, treaties and sovereignty benefits everybody. Uh, the phrase wasn't, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, when you saw the water protectors uh, and, and, you know, media's uh, portrayal of them, you didn't hear people saying, um, you know, we want this uh, pipeline uh, somewhere else. You heard them saying water is life, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it detracts from this kind of reactionary politics of, of oh, 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 you know, Kind of, I mean, I think necess it's necessary to unsettle people <laughs> and really touch some nerves, right? And that's what we see with land back. But you know, beyond that, what's the conversation? What does that look like? And so I'll just say, um, in the work that we do, uh, 
uh, in the, the program, uh, the, the land education program that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's funded by the National Science Foundation. I think that's significant. Um, uh, it, the, the career award is, is geared, uh, it's designed to fund both educational and research programs. And so the educational component, um, we've been uh, in this COVID year and a half uh, invited to, to present on the work that we've been doing, the students and I, um, and uh, some of them are more local uh, venues like the Northeastern State University uh, Symposium, Symposium on the American Indian. Um, and I get emails and calls um, from folks saying, well, I, I've got some, some, some land and, and would love to, uh, to work with you on your know, tribal conservation programs and, and I would love to have this be a place where uh, the students and you know, future cohorts can come and, and carry out this work. You know, I mean, these are grand um, uh, 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 plans, but I think for me that that represents both a, a form of land back and also a form of restoring relationships, which is really what land back is all about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, one other uh, question. Um, first, they wanted to thank you for your incredible dedication to communities. Uh, Relating to Deborah Hadland um, being in the belly of the beast, I'm also an indigenous person working within several colonial systems, including a provincial government. Do you have advice for those of us in these spaces on how to not lose our focus on the collective needs of community? Well, here's, here's again, the way I suggest you do that is when <laughs> the Mechanics of these large bureaucracies and the powers tend to want to completely crush you and suck every bit of your soul out of you. Get out of doors. Take a walk. Take a hike. Uh, I, I, I really, I know that sounds simplistic, but um, I, I do think the way that we literally stay connected to our relatives is to keep those relationships experientially very alive. Uh, I think it's tough. And, and I and you know, any anyone who's working in, in a government agency as a native person, uh, I understand the insurgency you're involved in. And that's the way you should look at your work. You're on the inside doing the best you can to defend your people, to uphold your people, and to be a part of maybe changing, you know, that organizational culture. Make it a little less bureaucratic and give it a little more feeling uh, relative to the life that, that the people working in those agencies are a part of. So, um, Thank you for for doing that work because if we're not in, if, you know, uh, so I'll be honest. If if we're not in those, we don't have some of us in those agencies. Uh, what is it, Billy? Billy Frank always used to say, "Well, if you don't have a seat at the table, look out; they're going to put you on the menu." And so we need people that have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So thank you for working in your the provincial government. And I don't think for a minute you are not going to do good work for your people. You can do good work there. Well, I think it's also about incorporating the voices from your own community as often as possible and checking in with those communities and seeing what is it that people on the ground still need and be reminded of what that work's all about and what you're promoting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can add to any of that. That's so beautifully said. Um, part of my work as a grad student, and still I think about it to this day, is is you know institutional um, dynamics and this question of uh, that that Dan raised. You know, of like is change possible? And and I think it absolutely is. I would agree. Um, I think that it's incremental. Um, I mean, even looking within our own tribal governments, there's a lot of bureaucracy that was imposed and that we continue to work with to this day. Um, but if anything, 
of you know if, if I've learned anything as a result of working with um, bureaucrats uh, and and folks who are doing that day to day work in similar I wouldn't say um, you know the same situation but similar situation you know working with bureaucracy is um, there. There's the day-to-day -day grind, but then there's also the the relationships that you can form within the bureaucracy, and that does actually have a lot of. Um, I mean, and I won't purport to speak to it uh, in the same instant or in the same way that you could, uh, the person who's answering or asking the question. But I've seen how my colleagues and, and friends who work for, for example, Cherokee Nation, um, get good work done because of um, the the how good they are at at, at making and sustaining. Uh, building and sustaining relationships. And so I think there's something to be said in the human element as well. Mm -hmm. So we have two more questions. Uh, the first relates, goes back to um, discussions about um, teaching. Uh, this is from a biology professor who wants to know a little bit more about how non-Indigenous science educators can incorporate some of this knowledge in the classroom. Um, getting out of doors and having nature do some of the teaching is a good start. Uh, any other advice for uh, people in the sciences to um, create a more hybrid presentation to their students? There's been a big push this year in environmental science policy management, the department that I teach in, um, to get people to diversify their syllabi. Um, so that if you look and 99% of the authors of the articles that you're assigning in any of your science classes are all um, you know euro-american scientists and you need to mix up your syllabi and there's this assumption that you know diversity goes into the social science kind of classes and these you know hard science classes there's no room for diversification um, so there's been efforts at berkeley and other places to say no look at your syllabi and, mm -hmm. and mix it up and give students a better sense of who's writing the articles that they're learning from um, so i think other programs can can learn from that as well you know incorporate native authors into your mm -hmm. class don't just assume um you know that we had when we were working on building native studies at brown we called it the insurgency model like mm -hmm. there should be people in the geology department assigning native authors mm -hmm. there should mm -hmm. it shouldn't just be like oh learn about indigenous environmental studies over here it's a right. separate topic yeah. and mm -hmm. then go learn bio 101 here and you know organic chemistry mm -hmm. over here that there are ways of weaving um, writings about indigenous science and indigenous environmental studies into all of these classes rather than treating it as the stone you know novelty to be sprinkled on the top so my recommendation to that biology professor would be read the work of, of Clint Carroll, of Elizabeth Hoover, of uh, people like uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, and you will find that there is good material in there that will enrich, you know, what you are trying to teach. Find those find those native voices, and they are they are out there and doing good writing, good work, and I think that uh, I just want to second that. I think that's really what it's all about is opening up these fields so that we throw out the old notion of what biology and chemistry and geology and governance and philosophy and ethics were. Because if you want to understand indigenous patterns of thought, we never thought in boxes and we never worked in silos. And that is what you've got to try to model in your teaching of topics of biology. Hold in something about custom ceremonies, habits, indigenous worldviews. There's plenty out there. Something that's on my mind uh, lately because of the course that I'm teaching, it's a graduate level methods course. Um, I just got the third edition of Decolonizing Methodologies, and mm -hmm. everything that we've been talking about today is there. I mean, it's mm -hmm. um, it's a it's really a thorough and accessible um, um, rehashing of the Western scientific intellectual tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to read something that's going to help open your mind to how that is structured um, and how to break out of that structure, 
uh, it's a it's a really good book. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, you know, to what Dan said, you know, not thinking in silos, not compartmentalizing knowledge. Um, uh, I think Linda Tuhi by Smith, who's the author of this book, does an amazing job um, at just kind of laying it out and then talking about what research means to indigenous communities, what what research can look like. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, thinking about the students who I get in, in, in my classes, um, you know, I, a lot of times they'll come to my environmental course and, and say, why didn't we get this before? Why don't they'll come to my intro to Native American studies course and say, where the hell has this been all my life? And why didn't we why didn't we learn this? So there's a real problem. And, and it's getting a little better, at least in the, the you know, 10 years that I've been in the classroom. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a real problem with secondary education, primary education is that this is the first time folks are getting this type of stuff. If they're, if they're not coming from indigenous communities themselves, they don't, they don't know about these histories. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just second everything that's been said before, you can't silo out indigenous studies, it's got to be central um, to the way that we look at knowledge. Um, uh, and the same thing with 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 other fields. Um, you know, my colleagues in my department um, uh, teaching in Africana studies and Chicanx studies, you know, these are fields that uh, similarly have amazing things uh, to uh, offer the world and how we think about our place in it and our relationship with one another. Mm -hmm. I'll mention that the uh, biology professor was, had referenced reading uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, so that's a good start. And I've received some other, a bunch of other questions. Can you Give us the names of the books that you're referencing, and if if uh, when we're done over the next week, if you can send me some uh, titles, I'll put them in the LePage Center um, website just so that people can access them. One final question uh, is um, just brings us back to this idea of thinking of nature not as resources but as relatives. Uh, this person references uh, the 30 meter telescope on the summit of Hawaii. As so much of climate justice and environmental justice turns upon the accumulation of scientific data and the imperial possession of sites as laboratories, might the panelists speak on navigating these tensions between the sacred and the scientific? Mm -hmm. Well, the tensions are quite frankly those of, of the people who operate within a predominantly Western worldview. That's the worldview that has pitted the sacred and the profane, the physical versus the spiritual, the subject versus the object. And um, I think what we have found is that the problem we have with uh, trying to defend sacred sites, the power of sacred places, the living presence of the sacred in the world around us, again, is that uh, a lot of modern humankind has lost somewhere along the line the ability to, to the word I would use is feel that, feel that power, understand that power, appreciate it. And I, I think that's one of the challenges we have. That's not good. That's not an easy fix. And I think that um, that is something that, you know, we, we need to really think about. But I, I do know from, from talking to my, you know, uh, Hawaiian friends, I've got a lot of friends in the and, and in the Hawaiian islands and, uh, you know, uh, they're not a big fan of that of that telescope, and and the reason is is again that's that notion of someone came along and said, well, our need to know knowledge is more important than the knowledge that resides in that mountaintop for you. How you ever defend that objectively, I don't know, and that's the point. We've got a we've got a collision of worldviews. And so we're just going to keep working on trying to do what we can to help people to understand maybe a little bit about what we're talking about. Yeah, to, to just to kind of piggyback on that, um, you know, it's clear to me that 
you know, the way that uh, Native Hawaiians, Kanaka Maoli people are articulating their um, um, their movement against the TMT is is not anti science. You know, mm -hmm. it's anti bad and unethical science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and again, I mean that it, it comes back to uh, mm -hmm. all of what we've been talking about today. What are the origins of this way of knowing that claims mm -hmm. to have uh, a monopoly mm -hmm. over knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Um, you know, how does that um, reflect poorly on, um, you know, certain people's uh, ability to relate uh, in, in, in ways that acknowledge the spiritual, um, mm -hmm. acknowledge the uh, land-based connections that um, are really the, 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 the core, in my opinion, of the, the root cause of, of what we're seeing today and manifesting in, in climate change and, and mm -hmm. global burning, as, as, as Dan would phrase it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and also to, to kind of underscore that, you know, some foundational works on that. Um, Greg Cajete's Native Science, just uh, mm -hmm. laying it out. You know, again, Native people aren't anti-science. We have our own science. Mm -hmm. um, uh, DeLorean Wildcats. Um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Liz, uh, you want to pick up on that? Okay. Dr. Hoover, I'm going to give you the last word from Alaska. <laughs> from Alaska, yeah, on the water here. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, I think it's about um, the problem now is that the things are not being valued equally. So that if scientists wanted to go stick a telescope on top of Notre Dame, you know, people would not have had it. The world lost its mind when this uh, important building burned down, you know, important to some people's religions, and everybody wept over that and thought that was really uh, devastating. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to visit Mauna Kea and the camps out there and to see the way that people revered this mountain as a very important relative, um, as an ancestor, and to, to see the way that the, the myth comes in at night and the relationship yeah. that people have with this space and the understanding that, that you know, Kanaka Valley people have of the stars and the environment through a, a different way of, of seeing science. Um, so yeah, to, to go off of what Clint was saying, the same attitude that says like, no, we can stick a telescope anywhere we want because we want this knowledge is the same attitude that has extracted resources and caused all of the issues that have led to, to climate change right now. So it's all part mm -hmm. of a broader um, extractive settler colonial mentality that needs to be reworked if any of us are gonna survive this. Well, thank you all uh, for a fascinating conversation, and uh, I'll be sharing resources with uh, the people who attended tonight so that we can continue to read, including your own work. Elizabeth. Yes, thank you. I want to just, just swoop in here to thank you, Paul Rozier, for moderating this roundtable and organizing it and bringing this excellent um, and really stimulating panel together. I also want to give a shout out to the co-sponsors of tonight's event, the Center for Irish Studies, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies, the Department of Geography and the Environment. And speaking of the issue of settler colonialism, I do want to remind everybody that next month, we're gonna be focusing on the history of white supremacy and the crisis that it presents to the world today. We are gonna kick off the series with a roundtable on October the 6th about white supremacy and the way white supremacists use the history of classical Athens to advance their kind of political agenda. We hope you will join us. Um, you can register on our website. I invite you all to follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. And for those who want to watch tonight's program again. I am happy to tell you that within a week or so, it will be posted, the recording of tonight's event will be posted to our YouTube channel. So again, thank you to everybody. I'm sorry we didn't have an opportunity to answer all of, answer all of your questions, but um, we're very thankful for, to all of you for joining us and we hope you'll stay with us next month. So good night.